The Path to Authenticity is brought to you by GIA Miami. Founded by world-class mental health experts, GIA provides advanced care for difficult-to-treat conditions, including anxiety, medication-resistant depression, and obsessive-compulsive disorder. Using state-of-the-art methods, GIA can help people recover from conditions when more traditional approaches can't. Dr. Antonello Bonchi has assembled an expert team serving international clientele in a modern and resplendent Miami setting. If you or someone you love is suffering from depression, anxiety, OCD, or other mental health concerns, call GIA at 833-713-0828. You can learn more about GIA by clicking the link in the show notes or by visiting GIAMiami.com. Thank you for listening to The Path to Authenticity. My name's Tom Gentry. I think of this show as the opposite of small talk. You'll hear real conversations with real people who know who they are. We talk about what makes them who they are, how they became who they are, and how we might become truer expressions of who we are. I'm Dr. Dina Sadik, and this is The Path to Authenticity. If this is your first time here, thanks for checking it out. If not, thanks for coming back. I'm Tom Gentry, and this is The Path to Authenticity, episode 181 for June 28th, 2022. I sat on this interview for a while, and I feel like this conversation is pretty timely now. We had it just after the draft Supreme Court opinion on Roe v. Wade was leaked. And I asked the guest, Dr. Dina Sadek, what she thought about it. So you'll get to hear that. And now, as I record this, it was yesterday. That Roe v. Wade was overturned. So, Dr. Dina grew up in a Muslim home where she lives now, in Sri Lanka, where women have more control over their bodies than in many parts of the United States of America. So, we talk about... Her experience growing up female in a male-dominated world. The influence of religion on her life, as well as patriarchy. And I think you're going to enjoy this. So, here you go. Dr. Dina Sadek. As far as I'm concerned, Mm -hmm. thanks for doing this. You're welcome. Why don't you tell the listener what you do for a living? Right. So what I do for a living is I help individuals get healthier through nutrition and movement. I started off by going through med school and then realizing very quickly that prescribing drugs wasn't the calling And yet I did finish med school um, and then I got into fitness and then circle back to the practice through specializing in nutrition. So currently I work at a clinic and I also do online programs where I help individuals with making healthier choices with what they eat and also start movement. And most of them are like home-based workouts where you can actually work out at home. Hmm. So you reached the conclusion that prescribing medication wasn't the answer. 
Can you say more about that? There's yeah, there's a time and place for it. Like if someone has an inflamed appendix, of course you have to perform surgery and remove that when it's when it's so bad that the person is almost in a fatal situation. Or in the case of individuals who are in extreme pain, then yes, they would need drugs, they would need painkillers, they would need IV. Um, but for the general population, I just think that so much more can be done from the preventive side of things if you can make better choices in your lifestyle. And I felt like that was more of my calling. So I had to pivot at some point and make that decision. Hmm. So tell me about your childhood. You grew up in Sri Lanka? Yes, I was born and raised in Sri Lanka. Any siblings? I have two brothers, uh, both younger than me, so I'm the oldest. Okay. And then I think you told me you went to school in Pakistan? Is that right? That was later. That was med school. Okay. That was med school. And then where did you do your undergraduate work? So med school was the whole undergrad. Um, so how it works is we follow the British system over here, right? Okay. So high school comprises of O levels and A levels, which is ordinary level and advanced level, which is literally the, the London um, examinations. And once we are done with that, we then go into university. But because we went through the London exams um, at that time, the universities wouldn't accept us locally. So we had no choice but to look for op options overseas. Hmm. So most of your studying, at least before you went to Pakistan, you did in uh, Sri Lanka. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Everything, yes, from nursery all the way to high school was uh, in Sri Lanka. And, you know, we've talked about, well, I think uh, one of the things that really interests me about you is your take on culture. And you talk a lot about the patriarchal system. And, uh, and, you know, I assume a lot of it is about the sort of repression of women that you've probably experienced in your life. Is that fair to say? Yes, repression, suppression, <laughs> the whole spectrum of it. That's correct. So talk about that. How how did you grow up in, in those terms? What what was it, the, the kind of messages that you got and have had to sort of overcome in your life? Well, Tom, I clearly remember the moment in my life when I realized that was the reality for a majority of the girls growing up. I was eight years old. My second brother was born and we were bringing him and my mom from the hospital back home. And during the time my mom was having the baby, myself, I was at my grandma's place. And then when they called and told us it's a boy, my mom's sister, my aunt, actually said, oh, she really wanted a boy. Now, I am the oldest sister. I already had one brother. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I kind of felt like, okay, so she preferred to have a boy, even though she already has a son and a daughter. And that kind of instantly made me realize that there was some kind of preference for boys over girls in my culture. And then as we were leaving my grandma's house, going home, I clearly remember turning around and waving goodbye. There were a bunch of aunts and my cousins at the door. And all of the aunts are stay-at-home moms, right? Now, disclaimer, this is absolutely no form of disrespect to any stay-at-home moms. I come from that culture where all women in my mom's generation are stay-at-home moms. They didn't go to any kind of schooling after high school, and they would be groomed to get married and then become wives and mothers. So at that point, I was only eight. And then when I turned around and looked at my aunts waving goodbye, every single one of them are stay at home moms. And, and I, at that point, I decided I wanted a different reality in the sense that I wanted to grow up to be that sister to my two younger brothers now, 
who could be an example and who could make a difference in society. And, and I'm not exaggerating when I say I genuinely had that epiphany at that point. I'm like, I need to make a difference. At eight years old. That I had at eight years old. Uh, you know what? It wasn't even eight. It was still like just before I was eight. So I was like seven plus. That's when my brother was born. Yeah. So yeah, mm. you could say eight years, but that was crazy. And when I think back of that, I can just remember that like a movie and that moment changed so many things to me at that point. Hmm. But growing up after that, Tom, it's it's not like I felt so much of the discrimination as a girl because, I mean, they sent me to, to the best of schools that they could, even though it was this all-girls Muslim school. And frankly, I didn't like it. For some reason, ever since I was in the sixth grade, I was around 12, I started to feel like this isn't the environment I want to be in because the school that I was going to girls started speaking about engagements. They wanted to get engaged at the age of like 13, 14. I mean, they were actually excited about it. But for me, it was, it was scary because I didn't want to just finish school and then only get married. And that's when I began my first battle, which is begging my parents to let me go to the same school as my brothers, because by now my baby brother was older. He went to nursery and both my brothers went to this school called Lyceum International, which had this Greek philosophy. And I remember so clearly when we went to drop the little one, Luke, at the nursery, I peeped in through the gate and I was able to see the garden. And then when I went to pick him, I heard the band playing music and it was a whole different world. And ever since that point, I decided that I'm going to fight for this. And for the next three years, I fought that battle alone, begging my parents to let me go to that school. Every single day, we're talking like a thousand days. <sighs> Did you win? All the way from, I won. It took three years. So... <laughs> <laughs> so, grade six grade seven grade eight i was 12 plus 13 plus 14 plus and then finally they let me go um and my dad's reasons for not letting me go any earlier is number one it's not a muslim school hmm. it's it's got all the religions i mean it had islam it had christianity it had buddhism it had hinduism but it's not a muslim school number two it's co-ed so there's going to be boys there so that's not appropriate Number three, the uniform is not appropriate because in this school, they would wear a dress up to their knees. But going to the Muslim school that I went to, I was wearing a more traditional uniform, which I was covered head to toe. I had the hijab on. Since I was a little child, that's like compulsory for everyone. Hmm. And th this was his reasons. And then finally, um, I started to work hard because when I was in grade seven, I had another epiphany which led me to just commit to wanting to know what it feels like to be in the top three in the class. And then at some point he couldn't refuse because I was doing well enough that, you know, he, it, it didn't, it didn't seem right if he didn't even try to give me a shot. Hmm. Yeah. The quality of the education was better. Way better. But here's the thing, Tom, before I set foot into that school, into Lyceum, I was threatened. <laughs> I was literally threatened by my dad. I still remember that moment. We were on the streets. We were trying to get the uniform and the measurements of the new school. And he said, you know what? We're sending you here just to focus on your studies. If you even think of doing any kind of extracurricular activities or sports, or if we hear anything crazy about you, we're just going to keep you at home. Even if it's the day before your exams. So that was the threat that I was given when I was 15 years old. So, you know, it's, it's, um, it's interesting to me, just the fear around raising girls and, and trying to shelter them from, I mean, he didn't want you to be around boys. I don't, it's not just the boys, Tom. I think it's, it's in my culture that I come from, which is, which is a, a Muslim 
Moorish background. It's very similar to the Indian, the Pakistani, and, and collectively this culture, the Bangladeshi, the Maldivian, collectively this part of the world is called the Desi culture, D-E-S-I, the Desi culture. And people are very concerned about what other people are going to talk. There's this famous saying in Hindi and Urdu, which is log kya kahegi, which means what will people say? What will people think? And it's really sad because parents would go to the extent of honor killing. Like in Afghanistan, we've heard crazy stories of, of parents literally going to the extent of honor killing their daughters because they don't want other people to have anything negative to say about them. So mm. honor is tied to the behavior and control of the daughters. So it's not even so much about the safety. Yes, it's 50% the safety of the daughters. But it's equally important for people to be so concerned about what will society think and say as well. So it's just like institutionalized shame. It's shame, it's control, it's patriarchy, and it's it's patriarchy mixed with misogyny as well. Yeah. Hmm. How would you say this has affected you in your adult life? Or when was there had to be sort of a moment when you took a turn where I'm, you know, like, I'm not having this, I'm not going to live under this ideology. And you, you started to handle things differently. I imagine. Right. Wow. So, I mean, I would be sugarcoating it if I said, I'm still not affected. I'm still affected, even though externally people perceive me to be a very strong woman who has been through a lot, who has achieved a lot, and yet I'm still affected. Um, but to answer your question, Tom, I think, so there is a spiritual journey as well to this whole story, right? So back in my teens, even though I did have that struggle of trying to get out of that school, um, which was a bubble. So the school that I first went to, it was a Muslim girls only school. And it was such a bubble that even being a Sri Lankan living in this country, I didn't have exposure to the other communities. The majority, the Buddhists, the Christians, the Hindus, the entire school had just two girls who were not Muslim because they were the teacher's daughters. Mm -hmm. So on a day to day basis, I didn't even have that exposure of interacting with a non Muslim, which is ridiculous considering i come from an, an island that is a mix of all these religions so what these schools do is they create this bubble it's kind of like a madrasa right it's kind of like this isolated church like school like thing so then when i went to lyceum it was a huge shift for me i was struggling to even adjust there because even shaking hands with boys was something that we were told is a sin you're not supposed to touch um, <laughs> you're not supposed to touch the opposite sex. So I would get these awards. I was doing well academically. I would go on stage and I would refuse to shake hands with the chief guest. Mm -hmm. True story. <laughs> True story. That's how much the conditioning is. Like you're on stage, you're with, I think that was the mayor a couple of times who was the chief guest, who is literally like way older than my father. But because I wasn't used to that, that, handshaking it was just not a part of the way we were raised especially with men i refuse to shake hands with them um but lyceum actually made me more religious as crazy as it sounds because there was this islam teacher he came from saudi and at one point i got very very brainwashed um dr ajaz is in the room as well there was this indian scholar called dr zakir naik that i was listening to and i got pretty indoctrinated, Tom, at the age of 17, I wanted to quit high school and go become an Islamic scholar. At what age? 17. Okay. And 17. So I had finished half of um, my A-levels, which is the 11th class. I got three A's, including an, a world award because I had got a hundred percent for some of the papers. And yet, I hit this point where I started questioning myself, what is the point of all this? It's a very Abrahamic way of looking at it, right? This world is temporary. We're all going to die. We're going to have to go and face God, the day of judgment, 
all of these things. So what matters is what good deeds we can take with us when we die. I was like so brainwashed into that way of thinking that I wanted to quit at 17. And that was this moment where I was crying so much after I had prayed once. I ran up to my mom in the kitchen and said, that's it. I want to quit high school. I want to go to Egypt. I want to go to Saudi. I want to go to one of these places and I want to go become an Islamic scholar. So obviously that didn't happen. What, <laughs> what changed? Well, um, I mean, I have to thank my dad, even though he and I don't really get along that much. Um, he asked me a very good question at 17. He said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to go to Egypt. Uh, al Isra is the oldest university in the world. I want to go there. I want to go study Islam. I want to be able to speak about the reality of it because most people see the media version. People don't know the beauty of it. And I wanted to be somebody who could bring and share the beauty and the peaceful side of it because the media is just showing us the ugly sides of it, the politicized side of it. And he said, okay, but who is going to listen to you unless you have some kind of an education and some awareness of the world? He said, you have plenty of religious extreme people out there, but the rest of the world wouldn't be so in interested to listen to them unless they have some kind of an education that can enable them to even communicate with the rest of the world. And I thought, okay, maybe this is a mess some message from God. I'm supposed to go become a doctor and then, you know, spread the word or have this whole mission or whatever it is. But everything changed. Everything changed. At that point, I was a very, very studious, geeky nerd or nerdy geek, whatever we <laughs> want to call it. I was always only with my books. But ever since that epiphany, that moment happened, I just kind of went into this um, brain freeze or what do you call, just like writer's block. I went into a geeky block. <laughs> Say more about that. Your geeky block. What do you, what do you mean? Um, I just lost that drive and obsession to do exceptionally well, because for the AS level, which is the 11th grade um, exam, which is the first half of what we finally do, the London exams had just introduced that for the first time, we were the first batch. So for biology, chemistry, physics, I got my three A's for biology. I had scored 92%. For chemistry, I scored 98%. And out of which the three papers for chemistry, I scored 100 for two of those. Hmm. And that actually gave me this British Council Award for excellent performance. It was a big deal. But thankfully, when you do the second part of it, when you get the final result, it's a net of part one and part two. So the part two was really not good because I just I just lost that passion. It's, it's kind of like you're in a relationship and there comes a point where you're trying so hard and then one day you just realize you're not in love with that person. Hmm. It, it, it was kind of like one of those moments. I kind of fell out of love with the whole idea of obsessing with the academics. But thankfully, because part one was so high, the scores, the compensated one still gave me two A's and a B, which was still good enough to apply to med school. Yeah, that's what happened. Okay, so you mentioned love. So how did this indoctrination, how has it affected that part of your life as an adult? And where are you with all that? Oh, my God. Where do I even, <laughs> where do I even start? So you asked me earlier, like, how things are right now. So went to med school it was a whole other chapter going to pakistan people were thinking oh she's going to go to a muslim country come back more religious but the opposite happened ironically tom what happened is i went to a very remote university beyond the desert literally <laughs> and i ended up living with citizens from 25 countries majority of them were muslims no surprise it was pakistan but here's the thing, it really opened up my eyes to seeing what an impact that culture has on religions. So we had Muslims from Africa, we had Muslims from Asia, we had immigrants who had gone to the US and then come back to study Canada, the UK, you name it. And I was seeing different versions of Islam 
Um, and some of the versions that we thought was, ooh, the Holy Grail was kind of like, what are you guys doing? That's not even like a thing. And that really helped me dilute my, my extreme way of looking at things. And I just learned to chill at that point. Hmm. You know, I just learned to chill. So I wasn't obsessing anymore. I, and that whole mission of wanting to, oh, I need to go become an Islamic scholar just completely dropped away because I realized that so much of it is culture, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but med school in itself was a whole other struggle because when I got there, theoretically, they're supposed to be teaching us in English. <laughs> but as soon as I landed there, pretty much nobody spoke English. Hello. <laughs> mm-hmm. I I kind of got stuck. Um, if you don't think Christianity is dominant, I mean, here you are talking about Islam and you use the Holy Grail metaphor. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> that was kind of pun intended, but anyway, um, the languages, that's how the journey of the languages started, right? So when I first went to med school, the girls would walk up to me and introduce themselves and they would ask if I can speak Urdu. And I don't, I didn't speak Urdu at that time. And I said, no, I'm sorry. And they would just walk away. And I found that extremely crazy because I'm from Sri Lanka. And I was going to med school, which which was taking international students. And yet they would expect us to learn their language, which now kind of makes sense. But back then when I was just 18, it was ridiculous because I didn't know. So that's kind of what accelerated the journey into learning languages as well. Hmm. So, but we we're talking about love. How did we get to language? <laughs> Okay, so love has been um, challenging because I think I'm glad that in some ways I didn't yet settle because I've been through my journey and and theoretically speaking, for example, if I had got married in my early 20s, I was engaged. I went through an arranged marriage system, so I was engaged. I'm pretty sure it wouldn't have worked out considering the rate of change that has happened for the last decade or so, right? Um, So there were times when I was mad at religion, obviously, because when I finished med school and came back to Sri Lanka, I finally had the time to really go and dive deep into Islam and look at the politics and the history and everything. And I, it was exhausting. It was overwhelming. And at some point I was like, that's it. I quit. I mean, there's just so many contradictions um, for a long time, I didn't want any labels, but being curious, obviously, I came back to it and I explored so many different philosophies and spiritualities and explored meditation and so many different things. And I kind of came back full circle. So there's this branch of Islam called Sufism, for those who are familiar, which is the spiritual branch of Islam. And I'm sure so many of you in the audience as well would be familiar with Rumi, the poet who speaks so often about love and a lot of people misunderstand Rumi's work thinking that he's speaking about a lover or a woman when the truth is that he's speaking about the love he has for God. So I kind of found my home back through Sufism and through Rumi's work as well. Um, So it is challenging, Tom, because when people ask me, are you Muslim? I would ask them, what is your version of Muslim? How do you define it? Because very often I don't fit into the mold of, so many people's version of it i think right now what i can say is being born into a muslim family and raised as a muslim culturally yes i can relate to it but when it comes to some of the really really rigid ways of belief and judgment and how people look at the world in a uh what's what's it called dualistic way i don't really think in that way so that is a challenge even when it comes to love because People want to just box you very often, right? So they see my name, they see my surname, and then they would be like, oh, you're Muslim. And the easy answer is to say yes. But having gone through that journey, it's not like they can now put me into that box of being a typical traditional Muslim woman. Get it? So so it's it's been very challenging in a nutshell to answer the question. Hmm. Yeah. So... Do you see yourself generally as a Muslim or no? Or 
or a Sufi? See, it's so hard to answer that question, right? It depends on what your definition is, even when you say that, because it's kind of like this, it's kind of like this massive cosmic onion that has so many layers to it. And the deeper you go, the more amazing the journey gets with Sufism, which is very similar to Buddhism. I mean, I have been absolutely amazed with Buddhism and Taoism as well, which is the Chinese philosophy. Um, Lao Tzu wrote the Tao Te Ching 2,600 years ago, which is so beautiful, so beautiful. And, and I kind of am a fusion of Taoism Buddhism, Sufism, because of the the philosophy that that kind of intertwines between all of them. But culturally speaking, yes, there are so many things that I can relate to and more like empathize because I came from that culture and I can understand, but it doesn't mean that I I agree with a lot of things about it. Hmm. So, and you study Kung Fu, right? Ah, Shaolin Kung Fu, yes. Yeah. Which is um, a very specific sort of branch of martial arts, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Talk about that. Yeah, so that brings us back to the spiritual journey as well. So I got into fitness, like hardcore gym training back in 2008. And it's a funny story how I got into it. I actually won a radio competition tom (laughs) were you singing (laughs) no i wasn't i was i was in the kitchen and then in the radio they just randomly said they have this competition and you have to be creative with the answer you have to say what's the craziest thing you're willing to do to win this platinum membership at the number one gym in the country and i forgot about it and then later on i just created the answer of two things that I've actually done in real life. I fused it and I just called them up and told them the answer. And I forgot about it. A few days later, a few weeks later, they called me and uh, said, you're on air right now. What's the craziest thing you're willing to do to win this competition? I said, oh yeah, I said that I'm willing to go to a grave, exhume a dead body and perform a hip hop dance. Wow. Now that's okay. So <laughs> does that mean you have exhumed a body? I have. Then it's it's an assignment for forensic. Okay. We had so it was a team, so the forensic team exhumed a body. And interestingly, it's a love story behind that exhume story, exhumation story. Okay. But you didn't dance at this occasion, well, right? Not on that occasion, but I have performed a hip hop dance on stage at med school. So I just brought these two together to make it crazy for the competition. <laughs> okay. So how is the, the, this experience of exhuming the body also a love story? <laughs> Tell me about that. Um, yeah, it is a love story because in places like India and Pakistan, you have, um, this, you have landlords, usually politicians who own several hundred acres of land, right? They own them and there are farmers and then there are people who are born, raise their families and literally die on those pieces of farming land. And very often they don't even pay these people. So it's kind of like modern day slavery where people are like born, live their entire life and die on these plots of land and they would bring the harvest, be it rice, be it wheat, whatever. And they would give it to these owners, but they would only be just given food for them to get by. So they're not even paid money. So it so happened that in a very remote village in Pakistan, a very there was this farmer's son who fell in love with the owner's daughter, the landlord's daughter. And obviously they found out about this love story. They arrested the boy. They imprisoned him in an underground hole, basically. They beat him so much, and then he died. And then they just returned his body to the parents, saying that he went on hunger strike. But the boy's father didn't believe this story. He didn't buy it. 
and he won he took it to the court it became this case where they had to exhume the body to prove that it was a murder and guess what we proved it mm-hmm. we proved it because the ribs were so um damaged by the beating that it was proven that it was it was not just a hunger strike it wasn't suicidal it was actually a murder so it was a love story behind this exhumation wow interesting yeah. okay so so you won this competition yes back to kung fu so i went to the gym and then at that time um i was going through kind of a period of home arrest so when i finished medicine hold and on, came hold back on. to sri lanka <laughs> home arrest what did you do yeah so what happened is that when i finished med school came back to sri lanka i already knew i didn't want to practice as a regular doctor right because throughout med school right from the beginning i knew that prescribing drugs working as a clinical doctor it was not my calling i tried to quit several times but my parents didn't let me my dad would literally say if you would quit you're going to come home we're going to get you married period there's nothing else there's nothing else there's no other option for you so i had no choice but to finish med school because if i quit coming back to sri lanka meant i would have been just married off and this is when i was 18 19 20 in that age range um but crazy enough even though i did agree to finish med school i was engaged to be married when i was 22 while i was in med school there was a proposal my parents saw the guy's family and then we were just engaged in a few days and thankfully that didn't work out but when i did finally come back to sri lanka i put my foot down and said that's it I graduated med school for you now let me explore what I want to do. But of course they were not going to let me out that easily, right? They were not going to let me off the hook that easily. So it was one thing after another. Now they wanted me to go through the board exams, finish registering locally and then do the internship in some village in Sri Lanka. I was 23 and then I said this is it, this is a trap. It's kind of like the 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 rabbit being dangled the carrot what do you guys call it the carrot mm-hmm. being that's dangled it. and it, yeah yeah that's that's what it is because it was one condition and expectation after another now they're telling me to do this exam and then they're going to tell me to do the internship and then they'd be like oh just get married and then be like just give us two grandkids and i'm like okay this is not happening this needs to stop i put my foot down and said i need i need like time to myself i want to figure out what is it that i want to do because I still didn't know what exactly I had a passion for. Even though in med school I got into writing, I was like so depressed and I went through a lot of mental health issues because I was not happy. So I started writing. I started speaking and I feel like maybe the large reason why I was supposed to go to med school is to learn languages, to learn to be a writer and a speaker. That's what the training was like now when I look back, right? So they were not going to let me just have that time out and then again the thread started saying that um there's nothing else for you to do and then i just thought okay what if i get into writing because i've always enjoyed writing so of course that wasn't like welcomed positively my dad said this is ridiculous she's got a medical degree in her hand and she wants to be a writer and at that time the board exams required us to go for lectures in sri lanka he would literally drop and pick me for every one of those lectures and these were 12 hours a day tom hmm. 12 hours a day from from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. you're sitting continuously and just listening to these lectures and writing notes down and there's only so much you can do when you're not really you know into it I didn't want to go through with it and he was forcing me so they would literally take me drop me pick me and I was like 23 24 it was crazy and at some point I just refused and that's when it started when they said that they had a problem with me leaving the house to meet my friends because now the friends from Lyceum um the boys the girls they were like oh you're finally back let's meet up let's have a reunion and my parents were like absolutely not you can be seen in public with the guys like you need to get married and people can't see you cuz remember the engagement broke up so that in itself was like ooh what's people going to say i was like okay fine whatever i didn't really want to argue 
And then they had a problem with me meeting the girls at night. And I said, okay, fine, whatever. And then they had a problem with me meeting them for lunch. And that's when I knew this is just not okay. Hmm. This is not okay. I'm like 23 or 24 and they're treating me like I'm 12. And it was ridiculous. Um, and that's when I was pretty much in home arrest. I, I was not allowed to leave the house. I was stuck inside the house and there was absolutely no reason for me to go out. But the radio competition came at the perfect time because when I won it, now I had a reason to leave the house. So I started going to the gym five or six days a week. It was kind of like a prayer or like a, like a religion to me at that point. So fast forward a few years, I had achieved my fitness goals. I was really happy with how things had gone. And I, it was around this time that through Facebook, a journalist discovered me and my writing because I started to just pull my heart out, right? But I would never really say what it was about. I would make it general and say girls and women and in Daisy communities and things like that. And very quickly, people started to respond and at some point, I had to create a public page because I couldn't handle it on the private one. And when someone suggested that to me at first, I said, oh, no, I don't want to create a public page. That's just too narcissistic. <laughs> and at some point, I couldn't manage it because some of the posts that I was writing, people from South America, India, Mexico, you name it, right? Like there were women from so many different cultures who would say like, I went through something like that. That's crazy. You're just writing what I've been feeling. And that's around the time somebody had noticed what I had written, got me in touch with the editor of the Sunday Observer, which is the oldest English newspaper in Sri Lanka. And that was my first job. Mm. So in home arrest, I, I obviously had... The computer at that time so i started contributing articles and in the beginning they said we can't really pay you unless we see your work and we need to decide so i said absolutely that's fine so i still started to write without getting paid and eventually they in, in about a month they said hey we're happy to pay you and i started getting checks hmm. <laughs> and even then like i guess any other healthy parent or family would be happy to see their child having work being published in the newspapers. I mean, in my case, we started getting phone calls from around the island from relatives far away saying, oh my God, like, what is she writing? Even though I didn't specifically name anybody, people still were shocked and they, they couldn't believe I had the audacity to write the way I did. Um... And that led me to another writing job, which was my first full-time job as a writer for a magazine, which is literally the number one publishing house. So while this was happening, the fitness was going great. That was my my only drug, or that was like my only religion. And after almost six or seven years of that, I hit another plateau where I'm like, okay, I've, I've achieved my weight goals, I've achieved my fitness goals, but something's missing. And that's when I realized, like, when you work out at the gym, it's so physical and mental, but I needed something that was spiritual. And then I started to just Google stuff. And that's when I found Shaolin Kung Fu. And it turns out that that was a Shaolin Kung Fu school right here. And I just showed up. Hmm. And the master was um, somebody who had been in China for about 50 years. He was in his mid seventies. And it took him a while to actually accept me because he's like, what are you doing here? <laughs> right. So for people who don't know, can you describe Shaolin Kung Fu for them? Of course. So Shaolin Kung Fu is one of the oldest, I think it is the oldest um, art of the martial arts of Kung Fu. And it goes all the way back over 2,000 years, I think 2,600 years. And the Shaolin Temple is in China, in the province of Henang. And it is it is the type of martial arts that was designed for the warrior monks, right? Back in the days, um, the monks still had to learn self-defense because they had different clans and they had different tribes that would try to attack each other. And it was quite intertwined with the politics at that time. 
So the monks, the difference between Shaolin um, Kung Fu and the Shaolin monks and the other kinds of Buddhism, the kind of Buddhism you find in Thailand, in Sri Lanka, in Japan, is that martial arts is a huge part of their practice. It's integral with the meditation and with their practice as Buddhist monks as well. So it's a lot to do with self-defense, but it also has a part where you, you, you can hurt the other person if they're trying to attack you, but it, it's still coming from a place of self-defense. And there's also the version with weapons as well, <laughs> if and when needed. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, you know, I think about, I don't know if you've seen on Netflix, the series Marco Polo. Do you know about that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, so yes. the, the, there's the Shaolin character. Mm-hmm. Hundred Eyes. Hundred Eyes, yeah. Mm. And um, who supposedly Kublai Khan allowed to survive. He allowed the religion mm-hmm. to survive if this monk agreed to serve him and train his warriors. Yep, absolutely. In fact, it's the Taoist monk. Um, Hundred Eyes is a Taoist monk and Kublai Khan said he would spare the Taoist temple if uh, he would teach him all the martial arts, if he would teach his army the martial arts. But Tom, there's another side to it as well, right? With Kung Fu, everything that we see in the movies is a lot to do with the hard Kung Fu, which is the attack, the offense, the defense. But there's also the soft side of it, the soft Kung Fu, which is known as Tai Chi or Qi Gong, right? Which is what you see in that series where the monk, um, when he loses his sight and he's trying to gain back his strength, he starts moving his arms really slow. And that's when he's moving Qi, the energy, across. And that is so important because once you learn to move energy through our body, that's when we can really become better, even at hard kung fu and with all those badass kicks and punches and everything you see in the movies. So, so how long have you practiced this now? Um, it's been, I guess, around eight years, but it's not been very consistent because at some point I did go back to Pakistan. For training, I, I decided myself, so becoming a writer, working in that company, I still decided at some point to go back by choice because I wanted to finish what I started. So with the internship, I realized that I didn't want to do it in Sri Lanka because the, the route was just, again, so cumbersome. So I thought I would rather go back, finish it over there, and then come back. So that's when there was an interruption even with the Kung Fu at that point. Hmm. So, so what's next for you? Oh, next. What's next would be. There must be a book. To become. Right. <laughs> yeah, the book is long overdue. We've spoken about this, uh, Tom. The book is long overdue. Um, no, but you know, um, there's also the whole mental health side of things, right? There's also the part where I had at some point decided to go into therapy, which is a whole other show, I guess, for us to talk about. So I got engaged a second time. And again, it was uh, the traditional arranged marriage system. Again, it didn't work out. And I'm so grateful that it didn't because I thought it would be different because he was somebody from here, but it was living in the U.S. And I guess I was very quick to accept that oh it's going to be different it's not going to be as oppressive as controlling and as whatever but it turned out pretty much the same and that's when I went into therapy and going into therapy was absolutely amazing because before that I didn't know about people pleasing I didn't know about boundaries I didn't know about inner child healing and I think every one of us to some degree have those parts of us that can do really well with healing So at this point, um, yeah, I'm looking at the future and working on helping as many individuals as I can with getting healthier and moving in ways that's fun and not just, you know, it shouldn't feel like a chore. Exercise shouldn't feel like a chore. Mm -hmm. All right. 
So, man, we could do like a whole podcast, like a whole, <laughs> like a whole season of episodes, just digging into all the stuff we talked about here. I feel like <laughs> it's been really, really interesting, but so looking back, if there was a time in your life when the younger Dina needed support the most, when was that? What was going on and what would you go back and say to her? Yeah, I would go back to when I was 18 because one Friday in the afternoon, my dad came back home emotional with the good news that I got the scholarship to study medicine in Pakistan. And I wasn't that happy because you know what? It was a girl's only university tom mm -hmm. <laughs> girls in the university in a muslim country and that is exactly what i had fought remember back when i was great in grade six mm -hmm. but the very next day on saturday the postman rang the bell he handed me this massive envelope which was pretty heavy and it was a package from singapore that was my dream university the national university of singapore was my dream university and I had got the acceptance to go to Singapore. It wasn't for medicine. It was a science degree, a bachelor in science. And I went running to my parents to tell them the good news. Like, oh, my God, I got chosen. I got selected at National University of Singapore. And it's also a scholarship. But there was no reaction. Like, my dad continued doing what he was doing as if it didn't matter. And he didn't say anything. And he said, it's not medicine, right? And then he just kept doing what he was doing. And I went running up to my mom and I told her, and she said, you know, if it was medicine, I would have fought for you to go there. But I wish I could go back to that moment and tell the 18 year old me to have stood her ground and fought for that. Because that was a fight that I couldn't do on my own at that point. And for years to come, I was looking for that support, which I never got from parents who would have just asked me which place I wanted to go. So on Friday, I get a scholarship to go to Pakistan. On Saturday, I get a scholarship to go to Singapore. And my parents didn't ask me where I wanted to go. And not having had that choice was a trauma that carried on for years to come. That being a girl... I didn't have the freedom of choice in something that I had earned from my hard work. So I would go back and tell my 18 year old self that you deserve to have the freedom of choice because you earned this. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. Freedom of choice makes me curious how you feel about this whole draft opinion of the U S Supreme court. Oh, wow. I, I mean, I don't agree with it because I think at the end of the day, it's a woman who is going to go through with the whole process. And um, I think she really needs to have that choice for sure, hmm. which is a whole other topic. Right, right, right. Of course. <laughs> but here's the catch, Tom, from your final question that you asked me, right? As much as that is the right answer, if I would go back and if I had chosen to go to Singapore instead of Pakistan at 18, I wouldn't be who I am today. And I'm genuinely saying this, not because it's like, ooh, the cliche to say I wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't do what I did at that point and if I didn't go where I went. That's not why I'm saying it. Like, even though it was painful, it was, it was exhausting, it was traumatic, it was bitter, it was just a lot. I still don't, wouldn't be who I am today because I have friends who did go to Singapore right from my high school and when i met them five years or ten years later they hadn't been through such a diverse experience that i went through in pakistan like my experience was was exhausting it was very harsh but it was a rich experience mm -hmm. it was like jumping into the arabian nights book and meeting people from 25 or 30 countries mm -hmm. 
you know, because that's that's what it is like. Like looking back, it was like this adventure which just shook me in so many ways. I would have never thought at eighteen at that point that literally eighteen years from that point is now that I would be speaking like eight or nine languages. And I would have gone through all of that and survived and made it through to this point. Hmm. So it's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Well, this has been great. go another episode in the books thanks for listening you can learn more about the show and this episode's guest at the path to authenticity.com if you enjoy this episode please share it with someone leave us a review on apple podcasts or wherever you listen every little bit helps I want to thank the band punk rock opera whose music you hear throughout the show their songs are used with permission from the artist and under a Creative Commons license. If you're so inclined, check out the Patreon community. As soon as I do these interviews, I upload them to Patreon um, where the content is only available to patrons and for just a couple bucks a month. I usually post audio content there, exclusive audio content, probably eight times a month, if not more. And as these new episodes are released, as soon as they're done, they're available to patrons. So sometimes that might be two weeks before an episode is released or even longer. Usually it's a few days. Anyway, if you want to support, if you want to support the show, that's a great way to do it. So thanks again for investing your time. It's a big deal to me. Thank you for supporting me and supporting the show. I hope you keep coming back. Be nice. That's our story. I hope you enjoyed the punk rock opera. And we have one last piece of music for you. It goes like this.
Thank you. Good night.